Good morning, all, and dear participants, faculty members teaching geography, welcome to day two. And today you're going to listen to two beautiful, young, dynamic people who have strong links with geography, geographers, and geospatial technologies. I'm Professor Seema Mehra Parihar, convener of your refresher course, and who, of course, have direct link with all these three Gs, and for that matter, four Gs, what I shared with you yesterday. We all have to remember that if we are joining this course, we have to take this course forward, not only in these next 14 days, which are left of this course, but we also have to bring it to the practice. And today you have beautiful topic that is, of course, shared with you by Professor Atikur Rahman. But before we move on to his talk and lecture, I want to remind you that I need three things from you all in this particular session. Number one, all those 10 people to whom the organizers have allotted for you to report today between 500 words to 1000 words you all have to record that and send it to us i'll prefer if you send me it in writing between 500 words to 1000 words at the same time i also want you to remember that at the end of this course we are coming out with a book dedicated to Professor R.B. Singh, where we are going to talk about empowering mantras, which I discussed in the inaugural session. For taking the journey of 4Gs, geography, geographers, and geospatial technologies forward, and making a difference in physical spaces, social spaces, geospatial technology spaces, and ultimately, geo art. And making this particular decade, which is a sustainable development goal decade, where the implementation of all these 17 SDGs is going to take place, how geographers, our major stakeholders we all can talk about. So, dear participants, please give your feedback every day. Work towards that chapter and assignment, which you have to submit it by 1st December 2021 and report this particular session in your 500 words to 1000 words to the organizers. Now coming to today's talk, we are going to have today with us, Professor Atiku Rahman. He's a professor of Department of Geography, Faculty of Natural Sciences, Jama Millia Islamia. He has his education from Aligarh Muslim University. He was also a postdoctoral fellow at Center for Satellite Data, GIS, and GPS in Germany. He was a co-PI of Indo-Germany DSTDA major project. He's also a recipient of many awards. If we all want to have a look at it, he has been a steering committee member of many committees. And besides that, in case if you have a look at his profile, he's a true researcher who had learned in young age that I have to make use of remote sensing and GIS data, model it, and suggest strategies to make a difference in this world. And that's something, you know, what he's going to talk today. And the topic, in case if you want to know that what he wants to do, I like to share with you 
that he's going to talk about today, that resource which we all are talking about, air resource. Professor Rahman has published 12 books and 122 peer-reviewed research papers. You can take him as a model. I have tried that in this refresher course, you come across those people who are like you and can become your role model. At the same time, I feel, take, I feel so proud that Professor Atiku Rahman had been featured in the global list of 2% top scientists of the world in world-renowned university. And certainly, you all can be part of it. And in case if you want to be part of it, you all can ask Professor Rahman, how has he reached there? The topic he's going to talk today is assessing global air quality post COVID-19 from local to global using geospatial techniques. So that means what is happening around us, we geographers can participate in that journey. We all know that post COVID, geographies are changing geographers are making a difference but we all have to be ready and that's the reason why you all are attending this course ladies and gentlemen this particular lecture you're going to learn about assessment of spatial data modeling of spatial data modeling of global air quality changes using that particular tool and technology which is so much ours but in case if I ask you all, are you all using it? Certainly, we all are slightly hesitant. But remember, Professor Rahman is very much one of you, a geographer. And this result using remote sensing and GIS data show that in completely locked down nations, aerosol, optical depth, sulfur oxide, ozone, carbon monoxide, particulate matter and black carbon concentration have all decreased. Isn't it reminding you of that debate which you all studied in your thought classes between environmentalism and possibilism? He's going to talk about COVID-19 hotspots, whether they were healthy or they're not healthy. He's going to showcase you with the data that he has collated in his research. And is also going to motivate you and coax you and make you learn that you should all make use of remote sensing and GIS data. Following him would be speaker two for today, Ms. Megha Datta. She's the director of Market Development Association of Geospatial Industries, who's actually practicing geospatial to who's worked. She's a geospatial enthusiast with 18 years of work experience in the geospatial domain. She has built strong relationships with national governments, development organization, multilateral agencies, and private industry to demonstrate the value of geospatial technologies for societal and economic growth. She has had varied experience of communication, report writing, research and documentation. Aren't you feeling what is Megha doing there? I'm a geographer, I'm a teacher, and I have so many bright students who come and interact with me every day. If Megha can do it, why can't I do it? So listen to her carefully. Listen what she's talking about, geospatial world. And just try to see that what all can you all do it? I wish you all luck. I wish you all good luck. And of course, give you blessings so that we all geographers get together and start making a difference in this world. If this young, young person, Megha Datta, who had master's degree in psychology from Delhi University and who is a part of this world of geospatial community, you all can definitely be part of it. And so, I wish you all luck. I wish you all success. I wish you all good luck. And I also definitely want that you all should always remember that a time has come 
when we all have to get together and be a part of this mega ecosystem of geography and take this journey forward. That's something what I'm trying to tell each one of you. Expand your horizon. Work with empowering mantras and make yourself a happy, successful geographer with a feeling of joy, the reason why you all had joined this profession. And so good luck once again. Hope you enjoy these two young professionals, teachers, enthusiasts with geo tag to their name as much as it's tagged to your name. Uh, very good morning, good evening, greetings of the day. Uh, I am Atiqur Rahman. I am a faculty at the Department of Jawfi, Jami Mili Islamia, New Delhi. Uh, I am very happy to be with you all this uh, today uh, on a very important uh, issue, uh, the event that is being organized, uh, that is the two weeks refresher course on Jawfi, Jawfas and Geo Special Technique impacting physical, social and gender spaces 2021. This two weeks refresher course is being organized by the Ramnuja College in collaboration with Department of Jaffe, Kirodi Mal College, University of Delhi, during 22nd November 6th, December 2021. So in fact, this is very uh, important event for the young uh, you know, faculty members, uh, those who have been appointed in the University of Delhi. So as I have been invited by the Professor Poonam, uh, uh, sorry, Professor Seema Parihar uh, of Kirodi Mahir College, and uh, as per the organizer's request and uh, you know, uh, the uh, frame of uh, the course, the topic which on which I'll be going to talk uh, in an hour or so is a very important issue that is assessing the global air quality post COVID-19 from local to global uh, you know, level using remo remote sensing satellite data. So basically this is very important issue which is highly talked in the present day scenario globally. When the whole world is facing the COVID uh, problem, the post COVID situation, and we are trying to you know, adjust uh, in the post COVID days that is uh, in the new normal. So n number of things has been impacted, affected by the COVID. Uh, in the entire world, right from the small level to the large level and at the continental level. People have been affected uh, in many ways, you know, be it uh, economic activities, industrial activities, business activities, or anything, or education system and anything. So in that context, the topic on which I'll be speaking uh, is uh, specifically on the global air quality what has happened on the state of environment uh, worldwide uh, due to the post-COVID, due to the COVID lockdown that has happened in, in the entire uh, country in India and abroad. So in that context, the this issue is very important. It's important in the sense that I said that uh, there are two aspects of basically the COVID. One is positive and second is negative. So if you talk about the positive and negative aspect, so there are certain dimension of positive and certain dimension of negative. But before I go to the positive and negative aspect of the post COVID, and if I go on the state of environment in terms of air pollution, air quality, let me give you some introductory remark, which you already know, just to brush up, just to you know, sensitize you. We all know that in December 2019 in Wuhan, a city of China, novel coronavirus SR, SARS COVID COV2 has uh, uh, geared, uh, uh, garnered global attention due to its rapid transmission. Now, the World Health Organization termed this infection as a coronavirus disease 2019, COVID 19 in short, after polygenic studies with SRS COV COV. Now, later on, who declared, WHO declared this COVID 19 outbreak as a pandemic? Uh, and since January, uh, since February 2020, affected countries have locked down their cities, 
industries and restricted the movement of their citizen to minimize the spread of viruses. So uh, in India, uh, the lockdown wise uh, lockdown was you know uh, uh, started sometime little later in March. In fact, 25th of March 2020. Now, if you see other point, in spite of negative aspect of co coronavirus on global uh, level, the coronavirus has brought a positive impact on the natural environment. The countries have, where the movement of the cities, citizens, where the movement of citizens were ceased to stop the spread of coronavirus infection, have experienced a noticeable decline in the pollution and greenhouse gas emission. The present uh, no, research, uh, which I'll be you know, speaking on some, also indicate that this COVID-19 uh, induced lockdown has reduced environmental pollution drastically worldwide, including India. And some of the glimpses, glimpses some of the you know, outcome of the various researches that has been conducted by the top scientists of the world, including India, uh, I'll be showing uh, how the, they have been mapped and how they have been analyzed using a geospatial technique wherein we talk about the remote sensing and satellite data uh, uses and at the GIS platform. Now, the World Health Organization estimated that outdoor air pollution kills 7 million people each year worldwide and more than 80% urban population is exposed to unhealthy air as per 2020 study. In China alone, emission of harmful gases and other pollutants dropped 25% at the start of year 2020 and the quality of air improved up to 11.4% with respect to a start of the last year in 337 cities across China. This is the only case of China. Uh, we'll see some uh, other details of other countries including India. WHO further estimated that this change has saved 50,000 lives in China as per CNN you know, report 2020. It is shocking to realize that millions of people die every year because of polluted air, the smoke, and suits which are considered to be uh, you know, slow clear that we call as slow poison. Now, if we see the study that has been conducted by Khan and et al, that has been published in a very important journal, that is International Journal of Environmental Science and Technology in 2020, what they have seen that particular matter 2.5 level in some of the most polluted cities of the world during period of 19, uh, 2019 COVID lockdown, what we have seen that if you see the cities in the first column cities like uh, Delhi, India, London, UK, Los Angeles, USA, US, Madrid, Spain, New York, US, and so and so, what we see the average particulate matter, second column that shows during lockdown in 2020 was 32.8 in Delhi, London 16.2, Los Angeles 5.2, and so and so. Now, reduction compared to 2019 to 2020, what you see. In the third column, what we see is that the reduction in the PM 2.5 emission that has reduced 60% in Delhi, 9% in London, 31% in Los Angeles, and imagine 54% uh, in Seoul, Korea, and uh, Lahore, Pakistan, 63% minus, uh, minus is, uh, this reduction in emission of PM 2.5. The average deviation compared to you know, last uh, four years that has been shown. And this is a period that was taken uh, for the assessment of this particular matter. Now, as I said, that there is two aspects. One is a positive and second is negative impact of environmental effect of COVID-29 pandemic. So if you see the COVID-19 you know, pandemic, what we see here, you see here COVID-19 pandemic, lockdown, travel, restrictions, slowdown, economic activities, that, that is all there on the left side. That is a positive uh, impact. Uh, I'll discuss a little later. And this side is a negative impact. So let me see uh, the first the left side that is a positive aspect. Due to lockdown restriction and all, reduction in fossil fuel has taken place that lead to reduction in greenhouse gas emission. That is a you know, greenhouse gas uh, that is carbon dioxide, ethane, methane, and so and so. And the second is resource you know, consumption has decreased. That leads to reduction in pollution and improved water quality reduction in transport and industrial activity that lead to multiple impact, positive impact. That is reduction in noise pollution, improve air quality, reduce pressure in tourist uh, no, destination that reduce pollution and solid waste and other ways, ecological restoration. So these are the positive aspects. But you see the negative aspect that is uh, you know, pressure on hospital, PPE kits and other activities, increase medical waste, hazard disposal, PPE, increase municipal waste and so and so. 
So this side we have the you know, uh, that is a you know, naked impact, uh, the uh, plastic waste that was generated, soil pollution and so and so. So basically I'm trying to uh, discuss on basically the positive aspect on the left side of it. So let us see some further issues. Now coming to the geospatial technique that was the main focus of this today's lecture is how the geospatial technique where we have used uh, GIS, satellite data and GPS. So if you see the COVID and geospatial dimension is an interdisciplinary perspective. On the left side, uh, you see medicine, in the middle you have mathematics and right side social science. Now let us talk about the geospatial side where we apply a lot of mathematical algorithm and so on. So. So in geospatial, as I said, GIS, geography, and maps. So what all we get? We get a spatial temporary analysis, what has happened uh, today, and what was the state of environment, say, maybe a few months before, a year before. The second is the health and social geography, then environmental variables, data mining, web-based mining, and so on and so. And based on these parameters and you know, uh, outcome and modeling, what we get, we get decision-making, planning, and uh, community mobility. So this is uh, uh, as per uh, this model that I am presenting you is a, a very important study that was published in Science of Total Environment by Pardo in 2020. Now let us see geospatial data analysis on COVID-19. The job geospatial technologies plays an important role in tracking the spread of the coronavirus 19 by constantly updating the number of active affected people and providing real-time data and GIS driven special health information. You must have seen in your TV screens in news channels, okay, what are the state of you know, the COVID uh, infected diseases, uh, how many people are infected, what is the increase and decrease trend, what is the death rate and all. So all these mapping is being done that has been you know, shown by the different channels on the different media, uh, you know, national and international. They use extensively a GIS platform and satellite data. They use the medical health record data and they plot it uh, uh, in a special map, uh, in a form of a social map. In order to visualize and track the location of number of confirmed 20 COVID-19 cases, deaths and cor coronavirus for all affected countries, there are several you know, interactive web-based uh, dashboard GIS platform. These platform dashboard rely on the data from national and local health authorities such as ICMR, Center of Disease Prevention Control, CDPC, uh, uh, other government authorities, as I told totally you before. Uh, what I said before that, but geospatial analysis help to you know, epidemiologists to map disease occurrence of the multiple parameter that is demographic, environmental, geographic, the spores occurrence and understand the you know, origin and outbreak, its spread pattern, prevalence and surveillance measures. So these, uh, this way it is very important. Now let us see the real dimension of geospatial uh, techniques application. So if you see the Indian Space Research Organization, which is the premier agency of government of India, ISRO, Geospatial technology based solution. What they did, uh, the ISRO is supporting various state government even today, right from the outbreak of coronavirus, by providing geospatial data tool and location based solution to fight against COVID 19, including national level coronavirus tracker. ISRO carries studies uh, with different states. Uh, there are different regional boards and centers uh, with the help of them. Uh, they did uh, several studies using geospatial technology and the Bhuvan uh, no, portal. A geospatial portal that is the NRC Hyderabad portal is there where a lot of satellite data is available freely. ISRO also made an attempt to study various impact due to lockdown in terms of a state of atmospheric pollution that is air and water. But my concern will be restricted to air. air. So these are some of the you know, outcomes which I am showing you. Government of India is uh, Indian Space in the Institute of Remote Sending that is another premier organization of ISRO situated in, uh, in, uh, in Dehradun. What they did, they used the, the satellite picture and then they what they did, they mapped the AOD aerosol optical depth recorder. So what we see here, uh, the left side picture shows of the average AOD concentration during 15 to 24th of March 2020. And then if you see this one, the right side, that is AOD concentration during you know 25th of March to 5th of April. That is just after the lockdown two weeks after lockdown. So what we see on the left side, there's a lot of dark red you know, color in all the states, be it Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Haryana, Punjab and all. But if you see the left side picture, what it shows, it shows that there's uh, dark patches, red patches has uh, declined. So what it shows the uh, optical aerosols 
our salt concentration in our upper atmosphere has reduced. If you see bottom uh, left, so these are the index. Now, if you see the other pictures, say for example of, of another pollutant, a uh, very serious important pollutant that is particulate matter 2.5. Again, from left picture shows from 15 to 24th of March 2020. You see relatively, you know, less darker but darker pictures in Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, and Haryana, Punjab. But if you see right side picture, which is of you know 25th March, just after lockdown to 5th of April, the 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 the, the, the dark patches has gone. Now, if what do you see again? If you see uh, the another particulate matter that is PM10. Today we are talking about uh, more talking about the particulate matter 2.5 and PM10, which is very serious uh, you know, the pollutant for the respiratory element. So if we talk about the PM10 of 15 to 24th of March, and if we compare with the PM10 data of 25th to 5th of April 2020, again the similar situation can be noticed in this uh, picture. Now, if you see this one, uh, no, uh, if you see the state of environment, uh, India or the India and in the sub and nearby you know countries, nearby region, uh, what you see here again, the aerosols at uh, optical the depth recorder, what it shows that uh, this is for the different, different time period. If you see the top left, 2016 average data, 2017 middle one top middle and right top is 2018 and then 2019-20. So what we see that it's very clearly, you can see easily that the uh, AOD concentration or different time from 16 to 2020, that is the post-COVID lockdown has the has uh, the improved, the state of environment has improved. That means the aerosol con concentration has improved. This is another study uh, 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 that uh, relates to environment uh, of the state of environment of the country India. Now see, uh, another pollutant that we always talk about the nitrogen dioxide, uh, that is the columns of nitrogen or dioxide in the tropospheric environment. Now, what we see is here that NASA satellite data by using NASA satellite data, what uh, you, see, you see, geospatial analysis. So what you have the top left, you see 1st January 20 to 24th of March 2019, and then in 24th March to 20th April 19, and you see the bottom uh, two picture bottom right, is a post-COVID lockdown from 24th March to 2020 to 20th April 2020. What do you see that if you see the top two pictures, you see the uh, eyes of uh, red and yellow patches. So that shows the nitrogen dioxide concentration. Uh, remember that is a tropospheric column, that it's not the atmospheric uh, no, uh, nitrogen dioxide. So if you see bottom two, the slowly, slowly and uh, you know, large decline in, you know, in the concentration of nitrogen dioxide. Uh, the same has been represented here, you know, in the three-dimensional way, where you see the nitrogen dioxide concentration in India. You see Delhi, Mumbai, and Dhaka. You see the peaks. Uh, uh, this has been you know, generated by using Sentinel uh, 5P data. This is another satellite uh, Sentinel data, uh, Sentinel 5P. So again, to Professor Kamal. Now you see the on 24th of 25th March, bottom 20th April, the peak has reduced. And you see the peaks only at two, three places where we have the power plants. Because during lockdown also we need the power plants to have the electricity when we are most of the time indoor. Now, this was the state of environment over India. Let us talk about some other you know, parts of the world. Since I said in the title that we are trying to you know, understand from local to regional to the global. Now see over the China, what we have. Uh, if you see the top picture and the below picture, what you have. The, the the sharp decrease in emission emission of you no know, uh, gases polluting polluting gases uh, from bottom uh, you see less uh, and top you see the more that was 2019 picture and this is 2020 picture when in China they slowly slowly started lockdown now if you see the Wuhan uh, specifically in the you know Wuhan city so what we see uh, exactly the Wuhan city uh, in 2019 nitrogen dioxide level from 2019 to 20 you know what we have you see upper uh, top we have 2019 and bottom you see 2019 so red patches and then um, pink patches and dark patches is gone so what it shows it shows that nitrogen concentration has drastically decreased over wuhan in china now see this one over europe see some other parts of the world 
uh, from eastern part of China, India to western part of the you know, world that is uh, Europe. See the Paris and the Madrid and Barcelona and the Rome in Italy, Milan and all. So what we see at this top one is of March and April. This is the average value of nitrogen dioxide from March to April 2019. And bottom, you see the from the 13th March to 13th April 2020. Again, you see dark prices has gone. And if you see then the bottom, that is uh, the scale that has been given. Uh, what we have in the from uh, left, you see 20 and uh, right, you have the dark patches shows 160. So this uh, shows that the post-COVID situation improved, uh, you know, in terms of air quality. Now, see this one, uh, NO2 concentration of Italy. This was uh, Italy here also, but uh, I have zoom it it and we try to see uh, at a, at a, at a uh, finer scale what we see the uh, if you see is basically the milan where you have the dark patches uh, you know all across uh, northern part of italy up to the florence now see in the right picture what we have the milan the concentration has reduced uh, it has gone to about 70 80 microgram uh, per meter uh, cube now see uh, i put it studied this uh, satellite uh, picture that satellite estimates or uh, USA, southeastern part of USA, again nitrogen dioxide concentration. What we see during uh, 15th of March to 15th April 2015 to 19, this is a four year average data. And if you see this right side, that is the average data of March 15 to April 15, 2020. Sorry, that shows that again declining trend of NO2 concentration. Now, this is very interesting picture that shows the concentration of ozone over Arctic region in March 2012, uh, March 2019. The left picture shows, uh, that is a March picture and right picture shows the 12th of March 2020. So what you see here, bottom see, the Dobson unit. Uh, we have, we know that uh, ozone is uh, coming uh, up at a uh, very fast level, the uh, ozone concentration, declining ozone concentration in the you know, upper atmosphere. So what we see, left side, what you see, the ozone is very, you know, uh, right side uh, picture as compared to the left side, if you see, so you see the ozone concentration, you know, has uh, improved upon, you know, has improved upon that, uh, that, that clearly shows the comparative st uh, state of environment, you know, in, uh, in the, over the Antarctica. Now, there is another uh, uh, advanced level satellite of NASA uh, for America. What we have here is that what they have, there are two satellites, one is called MIRA, that moderate era respective, uh, respective uh, analysis of research and applications, MIRA 2, there is a MIRA 1 also. So if you see the MIRA 1 data and the first made available, that was made available, that was started, you know, people using 2008 and MIRA 2 was started, you know, launched in 2016 till date. It used to analyze AOD, optical assault depth recorder, aerosols, PM 2.5, SO2, ozone, even black carbon. Uh, so these satellite data is you know widely used for you know uh, comparing and st uh, studying and assessing these uh, atmospheric pollutant then there is another satellite that is uh, ares that is called atmospheric infrared sounder that was launched in 2002 on board lasa nasa aqua satellite uh, and that uh, the atmospheric infrared sounder is you know in uh, enhancing our understanding about other uh, weather and climate so this is, uh, is mainly used for CO2 concentration uh, with 45 kilometer spatial resolution. I do not want to go into that detail, uh, but uh, I'll show you the output of uh, these two satellite data, MIRA and uh, AIRS. So what we see here, if you see the countries with partial or complete lockdown. So what we see in India, we started lockdown from 25th of March, 2019, uh, sorry, 2020. And this, this is the number of weeks, what has happened? So different countries and and, 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 the, and the data we started lockdown. What is state of lockdown when they started say China 23rd January and so and so. So what we have, we started getting the, you know, the uh, data, satellite data and uh, by using geospatial analysis, what they did, uh, uh, the, 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 there's a group of scientists, uh, the Taluk, the RS, they published this research in one of the prestigious journal that is Science of Total Environment in 2020. They assess the aerosol uh, concentration globally. So if you see top left, uh, top right, bottom uh, left and bottom right, what we have, there are four word pictures that shows the AOD concentration. That is from December 2019, January 2020, 
and then February 2020 and March 2020. So what it shows that the level of EOD was 1.7 in January and that reduced 2.65 in March. So what do you see that as, uh, 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 the EOD reduced to uh, almost half and the, you see the scale, the scale shows the high, uh, the red patches. So if you see the word white, you can easily understand key where it was high and where it is reduced. Now see this one, the carbon monoxide, this is another very serious important pollutant. So uh, if we compare globally uh, by this uh, satellite data, so what we find that CO carbon monoxide was 123 to 205 part per billion, but it was reduced to 59 to 101 in most of the Union countries and other parts of the world. That again shows that the concentration of CO2 has declined post COVID. So these are the, some of the very important aspects, positive aspects as the students of Joffe, uh, you know, as the nominal sciences, what we see, this is a positive aspect. Now this is another important pollutant that is sulfur dioxide, SO2. What we see here that Again, the concentration of sulfur dioxide in most of the countries across the world has, you know, uh, decreased. So that, that means the, you know, that means the concentration of the pollutants has reduced the quality. Therefore, the quality of environment has improved. Now, this is a black carbon, average monthly black carbon. So if you see the South and Southeast Asian, and Asian countries like India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Myanmar, Thailand and many more. Uh, were experienced a huge reduction in black carbon between the period from December 2019 to March 2020. Now, if you see the geospatial analysis of ozone, uh, what I was showing you for the you know, Antarctica, this is for the whole world. In the case of ozone, the countries like USA, Canada, Western European countries and part of Russia has recorded, you know, uh, 312 to 405, uh, 405 um, uh, uh, in December 2019, uh, uh, which reduced to, say, for example, uh, 306 to 347 uh, no, uh, dB in March 2020. So again, that clearly shows uh, the state of environment globally. Now, based on, on these parameters, there were several other parameters that was uh, used to analyze uh, the air quality index. So this is a total, in totality the outcome, the index, the air quality index by using SO2, carbon dioxide, black carbon, carbon monoxide, PM2.5, PM10 and so and so. What we do is we uh, calculate the air quality index. So if you see the air quality index, the overall quality of state of quality of environment, uh, air pollution in terms of air pollution, uh, in the month of December 2019 and January 2020, overall pollution level is found to be high in all the urbanized areas including uh, urbanized you know, and our industrialized nations uh, like China, India, Japan, but decreased considerably thereafter. So what we see air quality that has, uh, there were six categories from very good to good, moderate and to hazardous. Now, what we see, what was the change of rate that was also calculated? That is from the first to second level, from first to third level and first to fourth level and from date of lockdown. So what is state of you no know, change? What was the change percent? If you see that uh, no, uh, the stable third column, first to second and first to third, the negative value say you in USA after lockdown, no lockdown. Uh, see what we have: nineteen percent, no moderate negatively change. You know? then partial lockdown, full lockdown after uh, full lockdown, what has happened? What has happened in Philippines? Twenty-one uh, percent, you know, uh, improvement has taken place in the uh, after the complete lockdown. Now. This is another representation of uh, air quality in selected cities uh, based on the data that uh, that uh, what we have uh, here uh, based on this data. Uh, this data was plotted in this you know matrix. So what we see the state of air quality and what we see here uh, that is change state of change. So what we see in the right side index that is change rate high negative moderate negative high positive. So high positive change is good state of environment has hazardous. So if you see the colors and see in Delhi, say for example, what is state of change? So you can see the air quality change and the change rate. What is the rate of change? So let us see sir, at the, some local level uh, at the capital city of Delhi. So there was another study that is very important study that was conducted by, you know, uh, Shushanta Mehto and Sudesh Pal uh, that was again uh, published in Science, Science of Total Environment. So what they did, we, they tried to study the state of uh, no, 
uh, environment uh, that is over Delhi. So what they have done, they have studied the National Air Quality Index. They took a lot of parameters, but uh, just to because of time, I put it only a few slides and in that I took up say National Air Quality Index. So what we have the low, the low state of uh, air quality index is 22. Now highest is 309. So what you see in March, no? Uh, it was very high, but slowly, slowly, when we approached the lockdown, see, 25th of March, the lockdown started in 24 March. So 26th, 7th of March, and so on. So, so what has happened? The change of state of air quality uh, that has, you know, uh, that has, you know, uh, uh, gone, uh, you know, uh, uh, that has improved upon at a faster rate. So what we see here, uh, that uh, the, if you see the uh, first picture, uh, the top uh, left, 3rd of March, that is A, then B, 10th of March, then 17th of March. So the state of uh, air quality, uh, the data that was procured and by using the different layers that was you know, prepared in a GIS environment and those data were prepared uh, different layer and the modeling was done in order to see the average variation, what is state of concentration. So we have the pollution level data that is being recorded for 17, 18 you know, centers of Delhi, uh, not for the entire Delhi. And by using those pollutant data, point data, what they did and what we do is that uh, uh, we try to interpolate in a GIS environment. There are different you know, methods of interpolating, uh, interpolating the uh, point data uh, so that uh, we can get approximate variation, uh, uh, you know, concentration of the areas where the uh, air pollution is not monitored. So, uh, and then on that, uh, what they did, they have overlaid uh, the uh, ward wise you know uh, boundary so what you see the delhi uh, which is you are seeing the ward wise boundary so suppose if you are living in a particular say ward this ward and uh, the central part of delhi in this ward you can get to know that what state of environment we are exposed to uh, in that particular month say march or april or any year so uh, this clearly shows that improvement in lot of improvement in air quality index or different parts of the different parts of the national capital territory of Delhi. Now, uh, this is one example, say for example, as I said, that they have taken uh, various parameters that uh, SO2, NO2, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, particulate matter, uh, there are different particulate matter, but the most serious problem which uh, is being felt is by particulate matter 2.5 <clears throat> and to uh, particulate matter 10, because they uh, go uh, through respiratory system and get deposited in what you call in uh, lungs. So uh, that creates a lot of problem. Otherwise, there are other different particular matter. So this is uh, one uh, you know, example of showing the you know, uh, spatial variation in plotting of uh, NO2 concentration that is part per billion by volume, PPBV. So what we see that uh, the right side, uh, you see this one, this index that shows a high, high concentration of what you call uh, you know, so NO2. So what you see here, the you see my cursor, the high concentration of NO2, and then this is again here high concentration, the high concentration is here, but uh, slowly, slowly it has you know reduced. The blue patches you know shows the low concentration of CO2. So be it anything, what you say, I say uh, the, in fact this uh, we can put it a little bit before. So you talk about the NO2, SO2, and all, and then at the end what we can do is we can calculate the national air quality index for any parts of the world, be it India, China, or America, or the whole world. As I showed you in this slide that uh, a national air quality index has been you know, prepared for the entire world. So what we see here, the hazardous here. So hazardous, what we see here, this in, 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 you know, in December 2019, before the lockdown, the most part of the world was, was fire, falling under unhealthy and very unhealthy and hazardous. See this one, South America, Eastern part of America, uh, western part of Africa, see my cursor, and most of the parts of uh, Europe, uh, in almost entire country, India is here, and then eastern part of China, Southeast Asia, and you know, other part. But what you see here, that has you know, reduced, slowly, slowly that has reduced. If you go here in B, uh, that is a, uh, B, that is a, of January 2020, it has reduced in February and March 2020, see this one, March 2020, it is further reduced. Now, this is what I'm trying to show from the local. At the city level, Delhi is having an area of about 1485 square kilometer. 
but if you see this one so what do you uh, see here uh, we find that uh, delhi we can take example of you know uh, uh, the local level and uh, and uh, and uh, if it uh, take the i've showed you that china european countries and all that is again at the local level at the continental level i have showed and then at the global level what is state of environment what has happened now by using this you know uh, study this map from these special maps what they did they 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 created you know they created you know uh, they tried to draw the relationship and what they did, they, uh, they tried to generate the trend of 24 hours average concentration of, sorry, PM10, PM2.5, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, another pollutant that is uh, methane and the National Air Quality Index, and uh, eight hours average daily, you know, maximum. That is for carbon dioxide, ozone between 3rd March to 14th of April, that is lockdown started on. Uh, March 25th uh, in Delhi. Now see this one. Uh, this is PM10, and this is PM2.5. So this is the 3rd March, 10th March, 7th March, and 14th of April. So what do we see? Pre-lockdown, and this is during lockdown. So this is the you know vertical line that shows the pre-lockdown. In the pre-lockdown, what do we see? That air air quality. The you know the R square value is 0.279. You know. So what we see in the pre-lockdown, the what we see the air quality, air quality. This is the air quality in the standard hundred, you know, for industrial and commercial areas. But for the residential other area, it should be fifty. So what we have, the C is two hundred, then little down and up. And during lockdown, what has happened? It has declined. So therefore, the R square value is little uh, less, but it is positive. Now, if you see this again, two point five. What do you find? The R square value is what we have is 0 0.457. Uh, so again, in the pre-lockdown it was high, but uh, during lockdown it has declined. Same trend is you know uh, notice. Say for example, in you know in NO2 air quality standard pre-lockdown and during lockdown, and this is for the you know SO2 where there is not much variation. But if you see the two or three major pollutant uh, where we have the you know, uh, uh, the uh, that clearly shows the impact of lockdown on the state of environment. So this is you know, what I was trying to show you, you know, scientifically, uh, that uh, scientists and uh, other researchers has documented the state of environment. Uh, but uh, to be a layman, uh, the most interesting picture, uh, what I find over the net, uh, you must have also seen, uh, that um, you, know, uh, you do not need to have you know, any scientific study uh, once you see the ground reality, you know, this is a ground reality. So if you see this ground reality, this two picture, that is air pollution level uh, of, uh, of Delhi, that was published in an article in Reuters, you know, uh, a website that is uh, you know, a very important uh, news channel of the uh, globe. So Reuters picture shows that top left, what we have here. This is the state of environment on 17th October 2019. And today it is it is November twelfth. You know, on November twelfth, what we are experiencing similar state of environment we are experiencing. We cannot see uh, you know clear skies. You can see you know the sun like you are seeing any you know uh, artificial sun. But in the normal uh, days when the sky is clear, uh, when the pollution is less, you cannot even see for a single second. Uh, you cannot make your eye to eye contact with the sun. So the air pollution level dropped during. 21st day lockdown, first lockdown. This is for 17th October 19, and this is for April 8. See such a beautiful picture, same area, no change, and no no analysis, no modeling. This is a field photograph. So such a beautiful picture. What you see? In my entire life of 20 years, I'm staying in Delhi. I've never seen such a clear sky, such a beautiful you know uh, sky and beautiful scene uh, of National Mountain, India Gate. So picture you know, never tell a lie. Maybe you can say this analysis and this relationship and this plotting, this modeling may be wrong. But what we see, this uh, can cannot be wrong. These are the wrong pictures. You know the ground reality. You can say that this has happened. This has happened. The state of environment has increased this much, this much. But if I say, this this is a picture, so that uh, speaks volumes. Now uh, this is not the part exactly of the air pollution, but uh, just to sensitize, just to give you a glimpse in the context of what I showed you in terms of air pollution. 
that is the same state of the air pollution uh, we can have another lecture on on water pollution state of uh, water pollution post covid and pre covid as that of what we have seen uh, that uh, pre covid and post covid impact on the air <clears throat> what we see here is in in uh, this is again pre and post covid 19 yamuna river in delhi we all know yamuna crosses from north to south you know in the eastern part of delhi <clears throat> on the eastern side we have the uttar pradesh and the western side we have the delhi so what we see here on 21st of march 2018 this was state of environment no same place there is a same boat is lying since uh, years and back side is a noida tall high rising buildings you know this is supernova uh, if you go cross kalindi kunj from you know uh, ashram and uh, sarita vihar you'll, you'll see this place so what we have is that a uh, lot of foams what we see it looks like a fresh snow you know frozen snow and ice but it is not it is the pollutant that has been mixed with the you know, uh, with the water when the uh, flowing surface water mixed with you get such a kind of foam what i have seen in the last uh, two days before there was a very important chhat festival that was celebrated all across uh, north india so in that uh, the news channels were showing that a uh, lot of huge pollution in the yamuna and people are taking dip in the polluted water where we have high concentration of sulfur and ammonia and so and so and that threatened the state of water quality ground water quality and surface water quality so you see on 8th of march such a beautiful you know water such a clear water is not that clear is still lot of pollution several thousand and several hundred times of pollutant is still there but if you compare the top one and the bottom one there is large scale change so what you see here uh, you see both the state of environment see the water pollution is very you know reduce and the air pollution also reduce you can see beautifully the buildings you can see the stories and different you know other objects the supply or going on so uh, this uh, is again the picture of, from the reuter article that was published you know by this new channel so uh, in nutshell uh, what i was trying to uh, show you is that ki what has happened uh, post covid so to, to you know uh, at the end of my discussion and talk uh, i can say that uh, that uh, the post covid impact as i said in the beginning that there is positive and negative both but uh, i can say that uh, since the topic was more towards uh, quality of environment where we have experienced the high positive impact uh, where the state environment has you know uh, cleaned and improved a lot several fold uh, whereas on the negative aspect this is very sad and this is very you know uh, uh, a difficult situation for most of the people Uh, in India and across the world, where the people have lost their jobs, people have lost lost their you know um, uh, um, uh, relatives and friends and close uh, family members. That is very sad. Uh, the economic uh, growth has was slowed down. India's economic growth was went to minus thirteen percent, but slowly, slowly, thankfully, it is recovering. So uh, similarly, in all parts of the world, be it America, China, and Japan and Europe, people have lost their you know millions and millions of rupees. people have started starving so that is another very poor state of environment uh, that is the ground reality that that one cannot deny but uh, when you talk about uh, as a environmentalist as a you know as a as a, a common person what we can say that uh, we need to you know uh, think on uh, that uh, you know how to improve upon the environment and uh, last week uh, today we are talking about the climate as uh, planet sos we always talk about you know social issues sos on social issue but today whole world is talking about planet sos in his talk home there was you know long 10 days 12 days conference where the prime minister also participated so what they are trying to do is they are trying to reduce the emission so how can you reduce the emission when you uh, are not talking about when you are not talk, thinking about the you know growth rate the rate of growth at which you are tra- trying to achieve so if you want to achieve higher growth rate obviously it has a negative impact it will you know create a negative impact on the air and water and land so what could be the big question the big question is a midway you know to achieve the middle path so it is difficult to achieve the middle path because no one wants to compromise their you know growth rate everybody want to you know higher growth rate today say for example in india we are having a little bit a little over 5% of growth rate Ah, uh, when the Congress government was there, it was growth rate was in double digit. So I do not see any big difference to a common citizen when there was ten percent growth rate or even today five percent. 
common people is not being affected uh, in terms of positive, in terms of economic and all. It is rich people, those are being uh, highly benefited. So as a student of Jahvi, what I say that you have to attain, you have to think of a middle path, you know, and the middle path that how to sustain our environment, how to sustain our environment. So there are several series of conferences, uh, say, for example, the United Nations Sunday Frame uh, Work of Convention that was held in Japan. So we are bound to think on that how to sustain our environment, how to preserve the environment, how to preserve the air quality and water quality, what we drink and what we inhale. So the big question is that, ki, are we ready to compromise with our you know, growth process? A huge amount of money if you are in a pocket or if you are in a bank, when you do not have good health, when you are not in a position to you know, inhale good quality of air. So uh, the choice is yours. Choice is to is is on the you know uh, those who are responsible for providing the clean uh, air, water, and all. So now it is the right time when people are thinking. What we see today, the, uh, the climate change age of climate. Change. We having some lecture on climate change uh, in your course. So if you see the climate change, you know the large scale, you know uh, melting of snow ice and so many things are going on. So in Stockholm, people sit together, whole uh, world sit together, leaders of the whole world sit together, and they, uh, they, are, uh, they have drafted a resolution. Uh, we have other resolutions, series of resolution uh, in the past. But very sad part is that, that we, did, we never uh, uh, implemented the resolution. The countries, uh, those who signed, they walked out, even America and China and so many countries, they walked out. Uh, it is good to frame the laws and rules and regulations. But it is very, very, very difficult to you know to 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 apply that, to follow that rule, to be a, be even a common citizen. Anybody, you have to you know uh, follow the rules. Even if we follow twenty five percent, thirty percent of the rule, what we can do, we can achieve a lot in terms of air and water quality. Health. We need to have a good, the healthy citizen, healthy people. Uh, for any country's uh, growth and development, that is prerequisite. Uh, we have less money, no matter what, no polluted, no adulterated, no. So that is always good. So uh, my message to you, young you know, scholars and uh, researchers, is that uh, uh, as of us has to think twice, thrice before we act and before we do anything. So thank you very much. I'm again uh, uh, thankful to uh, Professor Seema Pariyar for uh, giving me an opportunity you know, to interact with you and to uh, you know, talk to you, to sensitize you on some of the issues, which uh, most of you already know. But I do hope that you must have learned something uh, from my you know, today's lecture. Thank you very much. Have a nice time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Namaskar. Hi, my name is Megha and I have been working in the geospatial domain for the past 18 years. I studied psychology, but stumbled upon this amazing domain by sheer coincidence. I'm here to share my experience of working in this field and with its numerous stakeholders, including commercial technology providers, policy and decision makers, bureaucrats, technocrats, uh, professionals, practitioners, academia, research community, and the development sector spanning five continents and nearly two decades. This journey has been extremely exciting, enlightening, and have given me a deep sense of purpose for which I'm ever so grateful to all those engaged in the field. I started my career in geospatial in the year 2003 when I joined one of the most innovative and pioneering companies in the domain that was actually not a geospatial content provider or a solution or a services company, but it was a media and a research consultancy firm. Geospatial World which was at that time called GIS Development, published monthly magazines, hosted resource portal, organized several regional, national, and international conferences for GIS, remote sensing, photogrammetry, cartography, etc. You see, at that time, the term geospatial didn't exist. But the concept of geospatial was inherently present in the minds of the professionals working across the world. It was only in the year 2010 that the world increasingly became aware of the integrated nature of these 
technologies and the solutions they delivered and the term geospatial got popular. I too realized that the subject geography that we studied in school when combined with science, maths and arts was represented in the real world as geospatial. And this combination of subjects made a very cool technology that has, re that has relevance and value for anything under the sun. Allow me to briefly explain what I mean by geospatial as a term, uh, which is prevalent amongst the professional and the governance communities, but not something that we are taught in school. Geospatial technologies answer two very critical questions, where and how. These are the tools that enable us to present the spatial context of phenomena and provides a platform for developing understanding of what-if scenarios by integrating various data sets together. Geospatial technologies is an umbrella term that represents a variety of different tools and technologies used to capture, store, process, share, disseminate, and analyze information about the Earth's surface and objects on and even below the surface. Today, geospatial data can be measured in five dimensions, that is length, breadth, height, time, and artificial, artificial intelligence represented as X, Y, T, Z, and A dimensions. With the addition of AI capabilities, geospatial technologies can help in problem diagnosis based on spatial dimension more easily and effectively. It can highlight what problem occurs where, helping administrators and decision makers to make evidence-based planning and address issues more efficiently. Geospatial technologies also hold the potential to provide a one-stop interface between the government and the citizens, ensuring seamless and integrated access to various government functions and services. Broadly speaking, it consists of the following set of technologies. First is Earth Observation, which is including all the technologies that capture information about the Earth's surface through various sensors mounted on satellites, airborne vehicles, including aeroplanes, drones, etc. Second is surveying, technologies used to make relatively large-scale accurate measurements of Earth, which includes LIDAR, radar, GPR, etc. Then comes the Global Navigation Satellite System, or the GNSS, popularly known as the GPS, which is actually the US GNSS uh, system, and the positioning systems. GNSS provides pre precise position or geographic location of people, equipment, or things, that are attached to a device that includes the GPS chips and also timing information. GIS and spatial analytics. This is the fourth one, uh, which is a conceptual framework that provides the ability to capture and analyze spatial and non-spatial data. GIS helps integrate different la data layers for enabling spatial-based decision-making. These technologies are being facilitated by IoT-based sensors, cloud computing, big data analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence to provide users from enterprise and public sector a large variety of solutions. Let me explain to you how these technologies are translating in real-life applications to deliver better results and outcomes. First is profitability. The world economy is run by GPS. This was a title of an article published in Bloomberg magazine way back in 2018. You see, in today's digital and e-commerce driven days, everything from your apps to rideshare services, online aggregators rely on precise location and timing data to survive and be prof profitable. As explained in the Bloomberg article, computers all over the world use it to determine what time it is, down to the billionth of second. When there's a slightest of disagreement among the computers, things fall apart. That's how powerful and effective this technology is. We saw a very palpable shift in the way businesses engaged with the geospatial world publications and conferences over the years. Whereas in the early 2003 and 20, until 2010, uh, there were more traditional users that participated in the con uh, conferences or other activities like from agriculture, transportation, utilities. Nowadays, you see a lot of digital enterprises, e-commerce companies, banks, retail, insurances, construction, engineering, and uh, infrastructure companies, system integrators participating. This shows the shift 
in how the technology has actually evolved for the enterprise users. Enterprises are using geospatial technologies for making critical business decisions that impact their bottom line, helps them expand their markets and give them more revenues and uh, deliver better, more nuanced services to its users. Then comes governance. The most significant shift and uh, recognition of geospatial technologies has actually been amongst the policy makers in the public sector in the past couple of years especially in the developing countries of Asia, Latin America, and Africa. The past decade has seen a significant shift in acknowledgement of geospatial data and technologies as a powerful governance tool. The same is reflected in the Agenda 2030 document that outlines the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. The document clearly outlines the role and importance of Earth observation and geospatial technologies in measuring, monitoring, and achieving the SDGs. Since its release in 2015, many governments have worked to incorporate geospatial technologies for assessing the baseline of various parameters, be it weather or climate, accessibility to education, utilities, water resources, urban spread, monitoring natural resources, and the changes over time, etc. A large number of countries have brought out conducive policies that have actually opened up avenues for the private commercial companies to collect, store, share, and use geospatial data. India is one such country. We released our geospatial guidelines and the draft geospatial policy in February 21, and uh, that has paved the way for transforming this sector in, in our country. It has unleashed the power of mapping technologies and done away with various licenses and rules governing the sector. The draft remote sensing policy by the Department of Space and the drone rules by the Ministry of Civil Aviation are also examples of opening up of the sector and very forward-looking policy initiatives in the recent times. A special mention here needs to be made of the incredible work that the United Nations Committee of Experts on Global Geospatial Information Management, or in short UNGGIM, has been playing in the domain since its establishment by the UN ECOSOC in the year 2011. UNGGIM is mandated to promote international cooperation in the field of global geospatial information and it comprises of all the United Nations member states as well as experts from international organizations as observers. The UNGGIM has worked with the member states and released the Integrated Geospatial Information Framework or the IGIF which is anchored by nine strategic pathways uh, and is a framework um, uh, and is a mechanism of strengthening national geospatial information management arrangements within and across member states at the institutional level and supporting the implementation of SDGs, uh, especially in the developing countries. I encourage all the participants of this program to learn more about the work that UNGGIM is doing under the IGIF to understand how geography is serving as a critical tool to transform our world. Incidentally, uh, the uh, conference that the UNGGIM organizes every four years, which is the World Geospatial uh, Information Congress, is being hosted by India in the year 2022, in the month of October. And uh, all are invited to join us for that forum. The third segment is society. So how geography or geospatial technologies are impacting our lives is through many societal applications. Increasingly, a large number of non-profits, philanthropies, global funding and aid agencies are using geospatial technologies for addressing some very critical real-world challenges, including ending poverty, combating climate change, saving our forest covers, and ensuring land rights to the most marginalized sections of the society. With a push from global goals such as the Paris Agreement, SDGs and the like, the connect between the private geospatial sector IT companies, governments, and the development sector has strengthened in order to access real-time, dynamic, and integrated geospatial data for monitoring resources, measuring progress, and reporting, as well as taking complex decisions, um, uh, keeping several parameters in mind. As the use of AI capabilities and modeling increases in spatial analytics, better predictive models are being used to assess, assess climate uh, change impact, disaster risks, 
monitoring agriculture shifts, yields, productivity, etc. We have a technology community. Uh, we as a technology community have actually reached a point of delivering pres uh, prescriptive solutions for some of these challenges very effectively. As a concluding thought, I would like to share my enthusiasm with all the participants on witnessing uh, the gradual transformation of this industry and the evident value that it's creating for billions across the world. In ensuring this growth trajectory continues for the decade to come, the role that our geography teachers play is quintessential. I wish you all the best for this course and for your contribution, I'm very grateful. Before I end, I would like to extend a warm thanks to Dr. Seema Parihar of Kirori Mal College and to have invited me to share my thoughts and to Ramanuja College for creating this platform. Thank you. Namaskar. Jai Hind.